Janice has had an extensive career in the NHS, and she's a, and like all people who've got superb careers, and who, and this is for the students, by the way, um, who have done well in nursing, they don't stay in one narrow area. Janice is a good example of somebody who's moved around and tried different experience, different areas, worked in different parts of the, of, of the health area, particularly within nursing. Um, she began as an A&E uh, nurse, and I'm sure we'll hear more about um, some of the things she's done. But she's, she's worked in a range of clinical areas and then moved into management. She's been uh, the trust on the trust executive of, uh, as a director of nursing previously, but is currently, as I've mentioned, in the largest trust in this country and across Europe as director of nursing. Um, she had a spell of six years with uh, working with the Chief Nursing Officer of England. And in that period, she was given some really tough assignments, I think it's fair to say. Um, one of them was to reduce MRSA, and she did. And that was a great success, and reduced it by 80%. Um, then C. difficile was reduced, another big challenge that everybody is aware of, and reduced it by 60%. And also implemented what was a, um, a big, controversial issue in the of this decade, which was about uh, multi-sex uh, wards. Uh, so we had men and women in the same accommodation, which everybody felt was totally unsatisfactory, um, but had been implemented in previous years. So changing all of those cultures has been some of her achievements, but only some of the achievements that Janice has, has been, able to, um, been able to lead on and I think one of the things that's really a mark of her tremendous um, success is it's been very much about changing culture, which we all know is the most difficult thing in the world to do. It's not enough to just flick a switch with people, you have to get people to believe and work with you, and I think she's done some fantastic work in that area. Um, so I've already given you the sort of where Janice is now, and I'm really looking forward to hearing Janice Stevens, who is, was awarded the CBE in and was named in 2014 by the Nursing Times as one of the most influential nursing leaders. We're very proud to have you here, Janice. And please welcome. Her. Hello, everyone. It's really lovely to be here. Um, it's. I, I was thinking about my journey on the way here, and thinking about how did I end up here. I started off from humble beginnings as a, a really important A&E nurse. Um, but you know, you kind of think, how am I ended up standing here and what's gone on to, to kind of get me into that place? And I think I just want to start by saying, firstly, thank you for the privilege of being here. Um, you played a part in my development and, and support around education. But I think also there's two of them, there's two people I want to pay tribute to that, that I think have helped me on this journey. And the first would, would be the person that taught me the values and the behaviours and the unconditional love and the support and the belief that you can do anything that you want. And it, it, that's my mum and it would have been her birthday this weekend. So I just, I'm kind of thinking of her at this time, thinking about, she's quite chuffed that I'm standing here today. Uh, and the second is the support of my husband who actually, uh, you, you know, is incredibly tolerant. <laughs> <laughs> but tolerant and supportive and just, you know, when I'm, I'm going to tell you about the arts experience. Just kind of like, just go for it if you want to do it. And that just kind of takes a, a lot of weight. So, so they're, they're really important influences and, and, and support in my life. And, uh, and I think, you know, have helped me be the person that I am here. Um, I'm going to share, share a story with you. I'm going to share my journey with you. Uh, and, and, and try to refer to the, the literature on, on some of the things that I've picked up. Um, I was minding my, I was in a car with Tony actually, talking about thinking it was time for a new challenge and, and what was I going to do next. And, and I, I, I kid you not, this is true. Tony was saying, well you never did get the London experience, did you? We're in the car. And I'm like, well you never know. Two hours later I got a phone call. <laughs> no kidding you. Just to set up with from the TDA saying, um, we'd, we'd like you to go, and what did they describe it as? Steady the ship. <laughs> so, so literally two weeks later, I was at Bart's Health. Um, and it has been the most incredible eight months so far. 
uh, of, of, uh, of my career really for, for lots of different reasons and, and I thought I'd share the experience because I think I'm going to tell you stuff that I think you could find in most organisations so I don't think, even though we're in special measures and not in a great place, that actually if you walk some of the wards, you would see some of the things or hear about some of the things that, that I'm telling you about tonight. So I don't think we're unique. The fact we're in special measures doesn't mean that, you know, it means we've got a lot to do. But I often think, I've, in my career, I've worked with a lot of trusts. And you sometimes think when you go in, even though you see fantastic things, you do think they're for the grace of God. And I know any nurse director that or senior nurse leader that's sitting here would, would have that same view. So what can I tell you about my experience? So I'm going to kind of just give you a little bit of background because I think just understanding the scale of BART is, is worth, worth understanding. The challenges that I faced, and, and just up with some of my observations, then I'll link it to the literature and then I'll tell you about what I've done and just my observations of, uh, of these elements. Does that seem like a reasonable thing to do? Cool. So it is the biggest trust in Europe, actually, but it's enormous. But it's not just lots of sites, it, well, there are a lot of sites, but there is, you know, you've got a great big London teaching hospital, a whacking big blue PFI in the middle of Whitechapel that looks like somebody's dropped a spaceship into, into the East End. You've got, the, you've got the oldest hospital in the country, St Bartholomew's, which is a stunning, stunning combination of old and new that's now turned into one of the world leading heart attack hospitals. So you've got two big places like that and then you've got a range of districts. So you've got Whips Cross, which, is, which has always had its challenges as a district general hospital. Newham, which is a small, smaller trust that's kind of, you know, that's got some really good stuff, um, but, it's, but it's kind of sat on the periphery. And then Mile End and, um, <coughs> and, and some community services. Um, I was there six weeks when I got an invitation to, open, to go to the dent dental hospital opening it. Because at that point I went, I have a dental hospital. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so I went to visit the dental hospital. Clearly. So it is enormous. And, and it, you know, this is the size of one of the challenges about how you make change at this level of scale. Um, you know, over a thousand beds, 15,000 staff, got six and a half. 70,000 nurses. Um, the one at the bottom is the one that's really stark. A thousand nurse vacancies at the moment. <laughs> just nurses saying, just take a deep breath. <laughs> I do it all the time. Um, those are the sort of numbers that, you know, half, nearly half a million emergency admissions. So it's, it's huge. Um, and I think that's part of. Some people have asked me, is it too big? I don't think it's too big. I just think you've got to be really, really organised. And part of our challenge was it wasn't very organised. So um, we got put, they went to, the CQC went to Whips Cross, found some not great care, but, but some good stuff. Interesting, of all the reds, the things that featured most strongly was the caring. So actually the, the, the greens featured in caring in all the domains across all the hospitals in, in most of them. So that kind of gave me hope that actually, although there was a lot to put right, fundamentally, both patients patients were saying that they they got care, good care. Um, but everything else around it has it is, it's been hugely, hugely disorganised. Um, the you know we're failing, we're not doing well on money. So I'll hold your breath. 135 million predicted overspend this year which we're struggling with at the moment, um, but we will come in on, on target. One of the things I think is really interesting, of the overspend, last year we paid 55 million in fines because we weren't hitting some of the targets. So, so actually, and that didn't come back, so, so you're like failing, so they take money off you, so you get worse. So that's, I think that's one of the real, you know, little p ch political challenges that, that we face. That we've already, even this year, even though they know we're busting, busting a gut to try and turn some of this around, because we're still not doing well on four hour, four hour in A and E, we've already been fined. Uh, so it, it's it's strange. <coughs> um, I've never been to an organisation with such poor IT. Consider it's a great big London teaching hospital. 
And my man computer takes 15 minutes to warm up, and I just not. So imagine if you're trying to do that in a clinic, or in, you know, you're a doctor trying to write down a nurse wanting to get on. It, it's really, really poor. Um, and, and I think as an organisation, what they did was when they were trying to save money, they do all the things like strip out the stuff that actually you think you can take out, but it's such a false economy, like communications and IT uh, and, you know, estate stuff. So, so it's really almost like at every level, we, we're not, we were not doing well, and we're not doing well. So, so that's why we got rated inadequate and got put into special measures. Um, it's also just worth, it's really interesting to see what else is unique or unique or particularly interesting about Bart's Health. We have a hugely diverse population. In New alone, there's 112 different languages spoken. And in uh, Tower Hamlets, which is where the Whitechapel bit is, about 80 different languages. So I have in my establishment 95 people employed around advocacy and language support. So it's the culture is the cultural world is, is really fascinating. Um, but actually, we have got representative pop population in the workforce. Forty nine percent of of the staff are from BME uh, populations around the area, and, and and a lot of people are local. So that's good. But it brings it brings interesting challenges and dynamics that I think we should become exemplar at working with and embracing. Um, and so, although we've got some good work, I think we could do an awful lot more. Um, there'd been, two years ago, a workforce review. And, and here's a lesson, I think, about best intentions. When the trust merged, there was in, inequity in banding and staffing numbers. Um, although there were still a lot of vacancies, and there was a decision taken to streamline everything across, try and make it all the same. So people were down banded. Um, lots of things happened that made people hugely, hugely angry. And even when I came in in March, they were there, there was still terrible, terrible anger and le a sense of letdown. Um, and lots and lots of experienced nurses mm -hmm. left, which, by the way, we're now paying on expensive agencies. So, you know. There's something about unintended consequences. You kind of get, well, why should you get an 8B here and an 8A there? Or, but, but, the, but there's something about how do you do that in a way that is responsive and respectful of your staff and your workforce. Um, but, and, it, and it caused a lot of problems. And so when I came in, the staffing levels were really, really not good in all the areas. Staff definitely felt, felt disempowered. Some still do because you're trying to reach so many people. Um, they felt they had no decision making, that they were being done to, not done with. Um, the culture is, is very different in all the trusts. And one thing I've learned, for anybody that's managing a multi-site or working in a multi-site trust, I don't think you have to try and create the same culture everywhere. I think you have to embrace the, the, the difference between um, and, and the uniqueness of each organisation. What you have to do is have a common set of values about how you behave, how you treat staff, how you look after patients. But, but actually, Newham is never going to be the same as St. Bartholomew's. It doesn't matter what you do. It's, you know, you've got a 19, the, the oldest hospital and its pride, first RGA at St. Bartholomew's. It's never going to feel the same as, as Newham. But, but, you know, you go to Newham and it feels like a family. You go down the corridor and everybody knows everybody. So, so there's something about trying to make that similarity just, you don't have to do it. The common current should be, we're all going to deliver high quality patient care and we're going to look after our staff and live by those values. What happened in the merger as well, which was, uh, was interesting, was that there was a recognition that this was an opportunity to deliver really great care to the population of East London, which has got a huge you know, level of deprivation. It's got the highest birth rate growing birth rate in, in the country, a um, lot, of, lot of issues, but actually there was a feeling that if you could get some of the care to work across all the path, across the site, so pathways that work wherever care is being delivered, that that was going to be better for patients, because clearly in the merger, 
you know, midwifery care at Newell might be different from midwifery. So you wanted to get some consistency. And again, the currency was about high standards, evidence-based practice, and, and compassionate care delivery of that. So, so they, what, what the trust did was set up what they called CACs. It just loves <laughs> NHS jargon. I'm going to try not to use too much of it. Um, clinical academic groups, I knew, I, I call them divisions or directorates, and they did that across the, across the trust. But what they didn't do was, and, and, then, they, and then they said, you are now CAGS, go and be CAGS and run the hospital. <laughs> so, like, it, was, it was almost John Luke Picard esque make it so. <laughs> and so they went off and all did their own thing. Um, and, and that's really interesting because what they were trying to do was set up matrix working and but didn't really look at the literature of what is required to have work in a matrix um, and what you know about what, what, what the literature says about matrix working which so firstly for those that you know just to kind of state what that is that's really about saying when you've got horizontal normal hierarchies Actually, what you try to do in vertical hierarchies, what you try to do is lead across. And often that means that you uh, can also have two lines of accountability. But what, what the literature also says is that to make a successful matrix work, it really only works in really mature organisations. So big corporations outside the NHS, you know, the ones that are multi -glo the globals, will work in a matrix, but they'll have been around for a long time and they'll have worked at it. So, when you're setting up a matrix organisation, you kind of have to over-engineer right at the start. And you, you have to actually be, it's counterintuitive. you actually have to put really robust governance in at the start and be really, really clear about accountability and responsibility. And if you look at what makes it work, the top bits, what, what, what Bart's did in, in Make It So was unclear accountability. It created bureaucracy. There was high levels of uncertainty. Um, so all those things that actually, what they say about you know, prevent the negatives, actually were, were living and breathing and were a really, really big part of the problem. And you know, I'll make it really practical. One of my directors of nursing um, for elderly care and, and an emergency department was working across three sites and had responsibility for 39 wards and three emergency departments. How can you lead that when actually it takes 45 minutes to get from the London to uh, Whipped Cross? So, so the whole way that it was being organised was really kind of not fit to deliver such a complex organisation that wasn't really mature. It had only been merged for two years. So what happens then? Things start to deteriorate, money started to go awry, performance dipped, waiting, we started to stretch out the waiting list, all those things that, that show an organisation's um, starting to fail, um, and that culminated with the Care Quality Commission going in and in, into Whips Cross. So once you get put into special measures, when you get put into special measures, that means a big part of it is you start to look at the senior team. So that's why I got asked to go quite quickly, because people start to move on quite quickly too. And we've got a new chief exec who actually gets matrix working. But, but one of the things was really that we really recognised early on was that, that just trying to manage everything across all hospitals wasn't going to work. So actually what we've done is change it so that we've got hospital-based leadership teams and we've still got the clinical academic groups, but actually what we want, they're the clinicians, multidisciplinary teams, that come together to kind of say, to focus more on the transformation and the pathway design. Because they never got time to do that, because they're always firefighting the, the latest emergency department crisis. So, so now the site leadership teams have a, a director of nursing, a medical director, a chief operating officer, and a managing director. And they are responsible for the day-to-day -day running of that <coughs> hospital and against an agreed set of standards and expectations on behalf of the Trust. If you, if you look at the work that David Dalton did on how to organise hospitals differently, 
I think we're kind of getting into what a chain of hospitals would look like, where you get the best of each other's skills. Um, so we've done that, and the, and the clinical academic groups are setting up networks where we're really saying, how do we do this even better? So what you know, what does orthopedic, great orthopedic care for patients look like into the future? Where's the where's the innovation going to be? Um, so that's that's where that's kicked in in September. But you can already start to see that there's a greater grip. So when we had a prob problem today at one of the sites, you can immediately you've got people you've got senior people there all the time, um, and you know you can start you can kick things into action. What also uh, is easier. One of the things that I found when I first went in there, if there was a problem on one site, it was really difficult to find one of the senior leaders to go over and sort it out. So I'd, I'd do a walkabout or somebody would see something and it would, it, you'd kind of go, where's the, where's the director of nursing? Where's the assistant director of nursing? Where's the medical director? And they would be, well, they could be in any of the sites. So now that isn't an issue. Now they're, they're based. They're still expected to work together. They have to do that if we're going to get that transformation. So, so they're working in that way, and then the other thing that we did was, with the CQC, if you've ever seen any of our reports, I mean, they're like this, um, and the CQC do write your own reports, and you've got to get to the heart of what it is. So what we decided to do was not just respond to just the, crash, the, the, the recommendations in the, in the CQC, we said actually we're going to have an improvement plan, which is, which is going to be our strategy for how we're going to get to a much better place. Um, and the TDA and the Care Policy Commission have been bought into that. So you can see on our website we have an improvement plan and, it, and it's called Safe and Compassionate. Because actually that's at the heart of what we're trying to say. Everything that revolves around is the patient and delivering care safely and with compassion. Um, and, and we're looking now to think about how to engage differently. Because people weren't talked to, they weren't involved. Um, they had ideas, but they were never. Able, they were like, "Well, I've got this idea, but it'll never happen." So actually, we're looking at how do we have different conversations with with our staff and with our patients uh, to to think about how do they help, or how do they deliver the improvements that we need to see? Because it's definitely my experience. For every problem we've got, a somebody sorted it, and b somebody will know the answer. And it's generally somebody that's working at the front line. So actually we've got to do that, which is what wasn't the culture before. One of the things that we're just embarking on is a programme called Listening Into Action. I don't know whether any of you have used that, but I've certainly talked to two other trusts that with special measures that used it. And it's basically mobilising, how do you mobilise? And it, and, and it focuses on having big conversations and, and real, lots of staff and patients together and identifying some projects that you can actually improve deliver improvement in, in uh, 90 days. So it's kind of lots of cycle, you know, it's really about getting, we're having our big conversations at the minute. And it is really interesting just to see how people, when you get them together and start going, start talking, they're full of ideas and it is really exciting. So we're, so we're trying to change the language. And I think that's a really, really important message, which uh, I think uh, helps around how do you, get people to connect in a different way. So, what have I been up to? I have a uniform now. <laughs> um, I, think, I think the thing to find out how to make change and, and understand what's going on is to get out there. It's quite hard with five hospitals and I still keep, somebody did say to me the other day, Yahoo, because it's really hard, even after eight months, I still I haven't been to every ward. I've been to lots, but I haven't been everywhere yet, and I clearly haven't met the 6,500 nurses. But I've tried to meet a lot. Um, so get out and talk. Find out when they've got events on and try and go to them. So that's uh, some of my midwives, actually, uh, uh, that, that were coming together for their um, uh, supervisory meeting. But, yeah, get together to find out what they're doing. So get out and spend time. Find out what's, what they're doing. I also do things like, um, i got a thank you card. Uh, from a patient at the, at the London, and I went up to this is really interesting. I went up to the ward and I went to the office and introduced myself to the sister who looked a little aghast. I said, I've had a letter from a patient. She went, Oh God, what have I done? 
And I said, well, actually, what you've done is great care. And I've come to say, well done and congratulations, and you should be proud. And she went, really? <laughs> <laughs> and actually, now I'm going to meet the patient. So, so some of that kind of small stuff does have a big impact. And, um, you know, it's, it makes people feel that you're valuing them. Um, I think, so, so get out and see what's going on. I go and talk, uh, we've got quite a preceptorship program, uh, really great BME leadership development program going on at the meet. So I'm trying to get out and just find out, and it's not, it's not like the role visit, I just want to know what people are feeling and what they're saying and what the issues are and what they think are the answer, ways to, to put things right. I go out and talk to patients and I care for patients, not as often as I'd like. I mean, we have clinical Fridays like a lot of organisations and I would say one in a week, probably every other week I get out in, and go and spend some time in some clinical areas and, um, and do some care. Patients seem to think it's okay at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> also, that's some of my uh, patient, patient uh, groups that they're from the um, patient-led assessment and, and care of the environment, cleanliness and the environment, lots of our place people. But we've got really, you know, we've got some really, really great patient support um, who are really, really keen to help us improve. So that was we were doing a celebration day, we were having a tea party in the Great Hall at St Park on Abuse, which was really cool. Um, but yeah, get out, talk to patients, and find out what's going on, and, and see where we can we can improve. I think the other thing was that. There was quite a lot of you know nurses that really didn't get together, and, and we in terms of having common purpose. So you know what our you know you can say glibly, we're here to deliver good care, we're here to lead, but what's that really mean? And in these challenging times, which is you know, with when there's so much to do, how do you get how do you get your nurse leaders together to actually talk to them about what really is important and where they need to focus effort? Because when, when there's so much to do, what you often find, and I, have, I did find, was that people, are, it's like rabbits in the headlight. It's almost like you don't know where to start. So you run around as opposed to just taking that step back. And one of the things that I've helped and supported with my nurse leaders is about giving them time to sit back and go, what's the problems we're really trying to solve? What's really going on here? And what, therefore, do we need to do as leaders to make the change that will make the biggest impact on patient care and staff morale? And that's some of my clearly having not a bad day. <laughs> and this is really something about, about small things make a big difference. When I was organising it, they said, are you going to do lunch for provide lunch for them? I'm like, yeah. And they went, oh, well, they did it last time. I don't go out and buy their own sandwiches. <laughs> so, you know, small things make a big difference. And, um, you know, we, we made it interactive, a bit of fun, had prizes, um, but actually it's had a serious tone, which was about, that was setting our strategic direction for the next five months. Um, so we were clear about where, what were the things that we were really going to focus effort on to make the biggest difference. And I think one of the things that is really important to do there was something like, I can't remember, I'm going to say 153 recommendations or expectations in the CQC report. I mean, there was tons and tons of things you must do, you know, warning notices, compliance actions, everything. But actually what I tried to do with, not just with the nurses, but with teams that I've been working with, is to try and simplify it. Because actually we, what we love in the NHS is complexity. Um, and I kind of like that. Because, because I think actually it's quite hard to get to the, to the nub of what's wrong and what you really need to fix. So, so I'm, a, I'm like a dog with a bone in that when we're talking about a problem, um, it, it's not people want to rush into action where I'm going, no, stop, what's the problem we're really trying to solve here? So we've had never events. They're, they're awful. Other hospitals, you know, we're not the only trust that's had never events, but actually people want to rush you on, send out emails, do all sorts of things, where I'm like doing, I did a session last week where I'm like going, no, come on, what's really going on here? Why is it that this has happened? And what do we have to fix to sustain change? 
So for me, there's something about simplify. And it's not, and it turns, it turns out that if you really drill down to all the things that <coughs> aren't working well when, when we're looking at care delivery and staff morale, it boils down to really four, those four themes, which is about making sure you've got the right numbers of staff. <coughs> First of all, what's, what's, what is it? How do you make sure using the tools that we've got? And I know there's loads of politics around that at the minute, but actually, as professionals, we need to be setting our staffing levels, using evidence-based practice, using the range of tools and professional judgment to actually say, this is what we need. Um, and so, um, that was a really, really important first step, and it was the first thing that I did. The second bit was that this, actually, if you've got a lot of nurses, or any clinicians, that have been working in an organisation for 20 plus years and you haven't been investing in their development, then actually I think people forget things. So unless you can be absolutely assured of the knowledge, skills and competence, then you have to put systems in place and you have to have a way to make sure that you can rapidly skill people when there are problems. But also you, for, the, for the future, if you get a bunch of people in, you want to make sure that they know all the things that you think they should know. Um, and, it, and it brings me, I mean, it reminded me of when I did the Healthcare Associated Infection Programme, I did used to stand on stage and say, nurses and doctors know how to do aseptic technique. Wrong. Because actually they hadn't been trained in the good old fashioned ways with a brown book and an assessment. So you, you know, so you have to make sure that you've got the tools, the mechanisms, and so that was the set. That's one of the second big tasks, and then there's the whole bit about leadership and what you really mean by that, and what's the way that you want to lead. Because there's so much literature on leadership, and you know, there's something about which is what does the literature tell you about where you want to go, and what approaches you need to take to try and get the outcomes that you're seeking. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. And then, and then the last bit is this notion of how, do you, how, well, how well are people doing? And actually I have no metrics, I have no more dashboard. I, I couldn't tell you where my worry boards were without going and asking people, because I couldn't click up and say, where are my pressure ulcer problems? And uh, but, um, you know, but we had no agreed metrics other than the normal ones that are captured, but they're all in different systems. So measurement is, you know, is really, really important on this journey because you know, it, it's almost like if you, don't know where you, you know, if you don't know what you want and you don't know where you're going, you probably end up in the wrong place. So, so actually having measures and being really clear about trajectories, about where you want to go, is really, really important. And actually, if you get the right numbers of staff with the right skills, and in that I put, I put compassion, and you've got great leaders that empower and, and kind of get the pride in it's my ward and what you're doing here, and you measure the impact of what's going on, actually that's at the heart of whether you're improving pressure ulcers, falls, anything. So, so we put a lot of effort, now that sounds like four things, but I'll tell you it's rather a lot of action, I promise you, but, <laughs> but every, every problem that I've come up against, it's, whether it's the never events or a ward that I've gone to where I'm worried about the care, it, it, it hinges on that. And so there's something for me about leading, you have to put these basics in as well, because it doesn't matter how empowering you are, if you haven't got the right numbers of staff, or they haven't got the right skills, and you have no idea whether they're making progress. <coughs> so it really sits at the heart for me of what we have to do. I think the also thing is the, is the setting expectation. We haven't got, I, the culture isn't one of absolute safety. We're not Salford. I wish we were one day. But you know, Salford, you absolutely, it lives and breathes, but they've been working at getting to creating a safety culture for 10 years. So it, it doesn't feel yet that people have kind of got their heads into avoiding harm. Um, and, and so for me, this is something I say to a lot of my staff, wherever I go, because I think that sits at the heart of it. If you don't stop somebody, 
or if you see something happening, you don't act. I also think that you're as culpable. But you know, that's the, the it's simple in terms of having simple messages about what, what expectation you have. So what did I observe? I go back to what did I, what, what happens to people when you're in an organisation where there's been a lot of change, they've not, they've not felt empowered, they've not been developed. And, and I think what happens and what I've seen is people normalise stuff. And what I mean by that is, you know, wards that have more, that are key getting pressure ulcers, they become, it becomes the norm. That's how they, we used to view infection. People went, infection happens in 2004. It's an inevitable consequence of, of um, complex care. So it was normalised, where in reality, what we had to do was change that. So, so that kind of normalisation <laughs> is, is really, really important to get people to kind of, I, I call it the oh my God moment, you know, which, which is, whoa, what's happening here? And, and it's not a criticism of anyone, it's just how it is. And, and I think it's how it is in, in, in a number of challenged organisations. I think there's also something that I, I was really taken uh, with, <coughs> a, a, with the work that um, Yvonne Sawbridge and Alistair Houston's done from Birmingham University uh, that they've called it the emotional labour. Have you, have you read their stuff? Have you seen the TEDx that Yvonne Sawbridge has done? If you haven't, just watch it. It's so powerful. It's only 15 minutes. It's on, you can get it on YouTube or on the TEDx app. But um, the literature on what happens to people when they're in the same area doing the same things, um, and why do people? And, and it obviously came out of the back of Francis and saying why do people deliver bad care? And and I'm really trained with this because I think it's a part of what I've seen in some of my areas, not just at Barts, but when I've gone out and about else to other trusts. Um, it's quite it's quite startling that uh, Menzies actually said, actually nurses particularly, she describes describes the tasks that nurses do as often disgusting and distasteful um, and quite frightening, and and it stores up the emotion, and and that well, it basically says that over time, if you don't get support, that actually means that you start to withdraw. And, and that's where you start to see people not lifting their head up when you go onto a ward to welcome you. Uh, and, and, the, and the work becomes more task focused. And I've definitely seen, I've definitely seen that. I've been on a ward, I spent a morning on a ward that I was a little bit worried about, or quite worried about, that the care was not poor care, but it was task orientated care. Patients weren't being neglected. They just could have been. They just could have had so much more, and and I think it was this. I think the stuff on that ward, over time, the emotional stuff had taken its toll. So actually, understanding that, and, and wondering if that's one of the reasons why we, why you might have troubled areas, is really worth looking at. I think also, you know, that there's also the issue of whether you've got right nurses with the right skills um, that you can't rule out, but. I think that's an important thing, and thinking about strategies for how we support nurses, um, and, and some of the stuff I'm going to look at now, which is how can we use the literature on emotional on emotional labour to think about how we might support people in a different way to see whether we can get that reconnection. Now I know their work that they've done when they've done uh, restorative supervision type models has, has been really revealing that people have done some, you know, have reconnected. But I think that's important because that's certainly, certainly uh, worth thinking about. <coughs> the, the other thing that stared me in the face is, is people don't assure. And, and that's not a trait just for Bart's Health, that's why I've spent so much time out and helping trusts. What, what, what we do is we, reassure. So when there's a problem, the first thing you say is get out to the ward and have a look what's going on. So you send somebody out to go to the ward and they, they go to talk to the staff and they say, what have you been doing, blah, 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 and they'll tell them the story, it's like, well don't worry, I've done this, done that. So they start the reassurance, then that person comes back, like, I've been to the ward, I've given, we've had a good chat, 
and they're going to do it. That's reassurance. Um, and the other thing that we do is we assume people. So back to the stuff about competence, we assume that nurses, I'll take the never event example, and we assume that nurses still know how to put in a nasal gastric tube and make sure that they always check the uh, aspirate before they start feeding. We assume that's the case. And then what you find is that you, you get a never event and then you start delving. So assuming is, is pretty, pretty risky. Reassuring people will just lull you into a false sense of security. Um, and what you really need to do is that bit of how do you absolutely know that the care that you're delivering or the, care, or the outcomes that you're seeking are being done consistently? What's the range of processes? I could do a whole lecture on that, but I would say that it's really around are your staff trained? Have you got the right controls in place? How do you check? And how do you check properly? Um, what's the feedback from patients? And what staff say? So you kind of you kind of look to do it in a range of ways. We tend to just do one bit unless we're doing it really, really well. And I think that's a really important bit because whatever you're trying to do to change, thinking about how you assure and what good practice looks like around that is really, really important. <laughs> um, <laughs> I to, I've got to change that actually because it should say has the army from the CQC got 62 we have. I can't think they're coming back to do the whole trust next year. Can you imagine how many are going to have to come? They'll, they'll probably have to hire out the hotel down the road. So people are nervous, so, so there's a lot of there's a lot of fear to act. <coughs> Because people are worried about consequences, and one of the leadership challenges about giving people permission to to do things. So, so that that was that's definitely there. We're still there in lots of places. So, how what what does the literature tell us about the approaches that you can take to lead people through change? I was quite taken with uh, this simple six approach to what the character characteristics are to get in a healthy culture because I think that's what I'm trying to get. I think that's what we're trying to get. We're trying to get the culture to be healthy and, 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 and actually that the culture is about safe care, compassionate care and, and it's too mixed at the moment. So, so I think that's quite good. I think there's something about what is the compelling vision. I won't take you through all that you can read it for yourself but, but that's not a, bad, not a bad framework that you could use. I like Marshall Gunn's defini definition because it certainly applies to Bart's Health and I suspect quite a lot of other organisations that are challenged. Marshall Gunn actually says that leadership isn't nearly as important when everything's going well, but actually it's incredibly important at times when people face uncertainty. And you know, you could put that in any hospital, any trust in the country, because I think the challenges, the financial challenges, the lack of nursing, the med medics, I think we're in really, really turbulent times at the moment. Um, and, you know, they, that uncertainty needs really, really good leadership. I think it's just something that was really, I liked this one, because I think this is what we're trying to do, that because of this kind of normalised behaviour, we do want people to wake up out of the inertia. And I, and I like Mr. Beckham's cancer's definition of that. Um, because what we're trying to do is excite people again, get them thinking about, about why, why we all come to work and, and what we're really here to do. So I liked that, I thought that was good. Um, I thought this was interesting, I only found this uh, this week when I was prepping for, which was really Sean, Sean Murphy's Habits of Motivational Leaders. Um, and actually what, what it was really saying to me was that actually you've got to have different leadership styles, um, but actually, which makes sense, but you've got to flex it to the to the people that you're working with at the time. Um, but also, that that kind of motivational leadership is about building strong networks. I'm talking to my chief exec today about networks, about bringing like-minded people together to talk about the things that matter and giving them space to do that is a really good motivator, I think. Um, so some of those I thought I thought was quite good. Um, I think a big 
part of what we've got to do in the challenge is to try to keep people up in simple language, really, which is, is to build self-esteem. I've definitely got a lot of nurses with low self-esteem. Um, I, I, I was on, I went to the leadership programme for our BME leaders and, you know, they got some of the stories they were telling me about, really, I, I would say, the, the lack of opportunity that they've been given. Um, you know, it was quite, quite heart-wrenching, really, really, and that wasn't just a, that wasn't just their experience at Bart's house. You know, and thinking so. So for me, there was so, I was talking about ways that to help them think about how great they were and what they were really good at and what, where they needed to go. But it was about trying to boost boost personal esteem because I think that's really sits at the heart of how you can really start to drive improvement. I think also a new journey, I've I found some amazing people, some awesome people who are like sitting there, that, you know, doing their job, um, doing just fantastic, innovative, creative things that are just there. So trying to promote some of those. Um, I found one of the ward, ward staff, uh, one of the ward leaders on the, uh, on the ward where most of the patients are, are immune suppressed and they're all in single rooms and, and they don't, you know, they're there for a long time because of their illnesses. And, you know, he just did something really, really simple, like he set it up in a way that they could come out for breakfast, you know, they were obviously sitting apart, but, um, you know, just, just sit, trying to think creatively about how to look after their pa these patients differently. And he just kind of did that and, you know, told them, we got, we got him to come to the board and tell his story about what he'd done to improve patient care. So for me, the, there's some stars and you've got to, you've got to bring them out of their shell and, and, and you use them. And I think just lots of praise for all the good things makes, goes a long way. So I think one of the things that I, I really, I think I'm saying to you is that to get people into a different frame of mind and think about how to lead, you actually have to connect with people on a different level. What we often talk about in, you know, we talk about, we give, we give instructions, we tell, uh, and we, we base, you know, the evidence base for this is X, so that's what we have to do. And actually part of making change happen is getting people to connect on a different level. So I think as a nurse, the way that I'll make the biggest impact is to get my nurses to connect on a professional level about why they, why they, do, why they came to do what they did and, and what they need to do differently to reconnect to get that heart back, you know, to get the heart back into why they, why they came into being a nurse in the first place. Um, so, so actually looking at the emotional, the spiritual and the physical is a really, really uh, good way to think about how am I tackling the conversations that I'm having? Am I having a logical argument or actually am I trying to, to get to the heart and, and connect in that way? Um, and obviously that was a source that from Ratcliffe has uh, developed that framework. Um, I think what's important to also be as a leader is actually to understand the evidence of how you get change at large scale. So it's not enough to just read a bit about the literature of large scale change. You, I think as leaders we have to understand it and if we don't understand it deeply we have to go and study it um, to, to really get a real sense of how we have to lead differently. So. I did an online program with Harvard on, on mobilising and organising for leadership, and actually it was with Marshall Gantz, because I wanted to know what the latest literature was and the latest thinking on how do you get people to connect when you really, it wasn't it was before I went to Bart's, but it's helped given there's so many people there, how do you <coughs> lead differently and your actions may be quite different from what you thought they would be, because you're actually connecting at a different level. So, so actually, there's a whole load of uh, you know, work being done to, to look at change at scale. And so I would say to you that if you're not familiar with it and you're in a leadership role, it's really, really worth getting a bit more info on it. I think the other thing that even if you're winning hearts and minds, as I go back to my four, four things, you have, you, you have to win hearts and minds, but actually you have to be organised. And Marshall Gans talks about mobilising and organising. <coughs> for large scale change. So the mobilising is the winning the hearts and minds, but actually the organising means you have to have the plans. You have to, you know, you need a plan of how you're going to get from A to B. 
and it has to be detailed, and it has to have timelines, it has to have measures in, and you have to follow it. So I think, you know, you have to do this with focus, pace, and grip at the same time as, as creating a compelling story. So what do you need to do that on a personal level? Um, and what is it, what have I, what, what is it meant I've thought about in the eight months that I've been on succumbent at St. Bartholomew, at Fox Health? So I think, actually, you need to be, have emotional intelligence. And, and I think everybody in a leader, leadership position needs a coach that gives you a chance to think about you and what, what you're about um, and how you can be the best that you can be. Um, that's Daniel Goldman's work on emotional intelligence. I think is really, it's pretty, pretty straightforward, but it's, it, it, it says what the features are of an emotionally intelligent person are. I'll say that I'm still work in progress, but, but I can't at least understand where I should be going. Um, and the uh, practice being calm is definitely work in progress. <laughs> so so some, of, some of those things, I think it's really, really important, I think, to thrive in a really, really challenging time to build your emotional intelligence. And what the literature says is, you know, you may not be emotionally intelligent, but you can develop your emotional intelligence. So it's not like you're a lost cause if you're not very emotionally intelligent. There's hope for us all. You have to be incredibly resilient. And the resilience is something that I didn't realise how tough it would be. And, and I'm, I think I'm quite resilient. You know, I did the six years of the MRSA when the numbers weren't going down. And everybody kept telling, you know, saying it was going to fail. But, but, and that was really, really hard. But actually, on a day-to-day -day basis, when you've got patients in A and E, when you've got, when you're so so busy, um, the level of resilience that you've got to have is huge. And the toll of, of the constant pressure that we work under in, in acute settings, particularly, enormous. And so again, understanding what what resilient factors are and, and where do you need to do work with either a coach or just kind of think about. I think the one thing I've learned about being a resilient person about myself is that bit about you've got to be optimistic. You know, even though it's really, really tough, you've got to believe you can get there. I absolutely know that Bart's Health can turn around what it's doing. If it gets good systems, processes and, and fix it and, and delivers that plan, it will, it will get out of special measures and, and will improve. I have no doubt about that, but then, you know, I'm, I'm definitely a glass half full girl. So, but, but some of that's really, really important. Um, I think the, the other bit about, I think the second one down about avoid making a drama out of a crisis. When you interact, you know, when I think when you're challenged, you do want to rush off and do things, as opposed to, just taking a deep breath and, and just just going, let's just think about this let's, before before we rush in headlong. I think that happens. Um, and I think the other bit is when you start to see the jargon is green shoots of improvement. But when you start to see things getting better, then you've got to celebrate it. I sent I sent my, and we've been doing some work on trying to get our all our e rostering improved so that we're eight weeks ahead with all the e rostering and it's you know our compliance our compliance to do that was 20 percent and it's it's gone up to 35 percent today so i sent the chief exec an email going green shoots <laughs> you know but I, you know I was, I was really pleased because that's a lot of effort that have gone into that but you know we've still got a long way to go but you celebrate i think that's the other thing about that i've learned so so actually, the days are tough, but, but every day, even though it has been, I say, the toughest job I've done, there's always some joy in each day, because I've asked some amazing people and you see some fantastic things. Um, so, so I think that's quite useful. I think you have to get really good at that, because you definitely are spinning loads and loads of plates. And I've, I've, I've developed some, a habit that and never had. It was always Tony that's done that, which was keeping lists. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, uh, I, have a, I have a plastic wall, you know, magic papers, and, you know, every week I start the week with my list. 
which have it's a real I'm so proud of the discipline I've developed for it. But but actually there's so many things that you've got to think about that unless you've got a list or you have a little plan, you, you can struggle. So there is lots of plate spinning going on. I think the challenges that are outside our control, and, and I would say in any organisation, is an organisation gets into, into trouble, but the scale of St Bart's and, and Bart's Health is, is huge. So when people are expecting improvement in weeks and it doesn't happen, it's unrealistic. And um, you, but actually if you don't make improvement at a reasonable pace, people will lose confidence in you and patients will lose confidence in you. So, so for me, there's something about it's, it's, um, it's, it's a challenge. I think the other thing that I just want to share this with you, which is, I called it the commitment, the commitment compliance model. If, you, if you're not performing at anything, you have to demonstrate that you're compliant. But actually, if you look at the literature on large-scale change, actually what you've got to gain is commitment. You've got, people, you've got to get people to commit to change and you should ultimately stop talking about compliance but actually when everybody wants their compliance information but equally until you have a degree of confidence you've got to have some data and information and you've got to know that people are doing the things because for such a long time they haven't been so I think it is a real I think it's a real challenge that you have to use the language, you have to get people to submit information, but you have to do it like they wanted to do it. And, and you've got to change the language with your, with your staff around that. But, um, and that, that's some of the work on large scale change, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. I think the real tough bit about being in special measures, and I say any organisation that might not even be in special measures might have requires improvement, is the scrutiny that you're under. Um, and I think that's quite relentless. And I, I added up one week, I spent 15 hours sitting in meetings, being scrutinised. And, and, and I just listed some of these. All these people want, want to know what we're up to. Now we've tried to organise it, so we put them all in a room once a month. But it is like standing room only. And people sit down, but, but equally, there's you know the joint overview and scrutiny, the health watch. They want to know what you're doing, um, and, and in a way, I don't blame them because if you're in a bad place, until you can show them that you're getting in a better place, they're going to keep asking. So you can't underestimate the toll that that takes, and actually, the resources that you have to put in it, into it. You know, I, we have people employed that are just providing all that information for all the time, but. Literally, all those people are interested in some, you know, in Bart's house at the moment. So, well, so that's kind of the journey. So, I'm eight months in. I am on secondment, and, and uh, I'm not going to stay there permanently. Um, what am I proud of? What do I? What have I done that I think is helping Bart's health get back on its journey? I think that I've, I've started to tackle some of the variations in care. Like most organisations, there's some stunning, outstanding care and there's some pretty mediocre care. Um, and what we've done is, is seek that out by using data information, lots of walkabout, and starting to look at making changes, or well, made some changes, where care isn't of the standard that you would want to expect. Um, and so I'm proud of that. All my um, leaders from about six, seven, eight, I call them the eight pluses, have all got competencies and a development programme and we're working through that with them at the minute. Um, you can now click on my computer, on, on a computer, and each ward has a dashboard. It's not completed yet, but we've got the metrics that we want to, to uh, look at that we know will demonstrate whether we're being compassionate, safe, delivering good care, um, which includes views from patients and uh, etc. That, that is now live. We're turning it into an accreditation program because I want to put some pride and competition. Um, so if you look at the work Salford's done on their accreditation and, and others on, on accreditation, I think showing you know people that get to green or gold, whichever colour is being used, I'm hugely, hugely proud of that and I want to put some of that in. 
Um, every nurse that we're about to launch, every nurse will have their own revalidation tool. We've purchased it um, and, and we'll be able to access education materials that will enable them to more easily revalidate. Um, and you know we're not expecting nurses to go and do that themselves. So as part of our revalidation programme of work, we're doing that. Um, I lead complaints, and, and at one point, the worst case, there was 140 complaints unanswered for over 25 days. It's gone down to about 40 now. Um, we've actually also, by tackling some of the quality issues, reduced the number of complaints. I said the number's large. We normally 350 complaints a month, down to two, just out in the 200 range. Um, so that's I'm quite proud of that. Um, and they're really committed to that, and they're really committed to doing all we can to recruit nurses. Uh, we've done really well with our midwives. We've recruited nearly all our midwives now, so we've not, not got lots of vacancies in midwifery. Um, we've put back sisters in charge as part of that, um, and that's, I think that is fundamental to trying to get the pride and the control back on the wards. Um, a lot of them haven't been used to running a ward, even though they were band seven. So, so actually a lot of their development uh, is going on around that. And, we, and as part of the money, the 20 million they got put in, we got more time for training so that actually we can keep our staff. Because we know that the main reason people come to Bart's Health is because they want training. And actually the main reason that they leave is because they didn't get it. So we recruited 1,100 nurses last year and 700 left. I know. I've done a lot. <laughs> so, so actually, by putting that better investment in, and actually we've just we've had a preceptorship program running because obviously you know from the literature that a lot we lose a lot of nurses in the first year, um, and we recruited over a hundred from the Abtegi University a year ago, and we've only lost two in a year. So I'm quite proud of that, um, and also we've recruited. Um, We've worked with the universities and all our healthcare, all our student nurses get given a contract uh, to be a healthcare assistant on the bank. Um, and that meant we recruited 94% of them this year. So we had 100 started last month and 100. Some of the nurses has now gone down to 800 as long as we've not lost too many uh, from, from other bits. So, so I'm, I'm proud of that really. And, and what I'm really proud of is nursing's definitely got a stronger voice than it had eight months ago. And it's not just my voice. What people are doing is blossoming uh, and getting their pointy elbows back, which makes really important. <laughs> so I would say that I'm proud of all that. And I know I've played a part in it, maybe by kind of setting the tone, but I couldn't have done it without the way my, my staff have risen to the challenge. And have actually, my bit is to give them confidence and let them fly. And that's what they've done, I think. Although we're still on a journey. <laughs> and, and you've got to keep, you know, people want, to, want results yesterday, and you can stick in plaster it, or, or you can do it properly. And the last thing I learned is I've forgotten how much I loved being a nurse in, in a uniform and out there and leaving nursing. So that's it. Thank you very much.